Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and today we're in Matthew chapter 20, and we resume our study in verse 20. Matthew 20, 20, get your Bible and open it up to Matthew 20 so that you can follow along with me and study the Word of God verse by verse by looking at your own Bible. You can study all of God's Word with me, again, anytime you want to, as much as you want to, at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, and that's found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Go there, choose, click, and listen from four complete series going through the whole Bible verse by verse. Study at your pace, at your convenience. There's, We're going on five here, by the way, so there's a whole lot for you to choose from, plus all the coffee breaks. It's all archived there. Tons of stuff for you to study. All the Word of God. That's all I care about is God's Holy Word. And there are 37 years of archives at the thebibleversebyverse.com. So check it out today. Bring your Bible and a hunger for God's Word. That's all you need at the Bible, verse by verse, dot com. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Matthew twenty twenty. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. So here you have the mother of the two apostles, James and John. She comes, kneels before Jesus, and she's going to ask him for a favor. Here it is, 21. He said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in the kingdom. Oh, is that all? The two two top places in the eternal kingdom you want for your two boys, is that all? That's probably what I would have said, but that's not what Jesus said, as we will see. But can you imagine? I can't imagine. I'd, I'd be so embarrassed to have my mom come in a situation like this. But mom and her two boys, James and John, they come together. Embarrassing. I'll tell you something else. They still don't understand that Jesus is not going to Jerusalem to destroy Rome and set up his earthly kingdom. That's what they're thinking. That's what all the Jews were thinking. That's why Jesus just finished telling them, his apostles, that he was going to Jerusalem to be betrayed and crucified. But, it, like I said last time, it went right over the heads of the apostles and apparently the apostles' mother as well. 22. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? They said to him, We are able. Empty words. We are able. Oh, sure. Talk smart when everything is going great and Jesus is right there with you. I will say this. She asked for the top spots for her two sons. Jesus' answer implied, you're going to have to earn it. That's not a gift. Salvation is a gift. Eternal rewards, whatever they may entail, those aren't gifts. Those are things that you have to earn. And someone from some time in human history will earn more eternal rewards than anybody else because of their dedication. And they're going to be blessed in some manner more than all others in eternity. But God doesn't play favorites. So those rewards 
will be earned. And God the Father will determine who earned the most. 24. Jesus continues. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. The other ten apostles are now angry at James and John because they asked for the top spots in the kingdom of Christ. They were not angry because of the nerve that it took, the brashness that it took to ask for that. That's not what made them angry. They were not they they were not angry because they asked. They were angry because John and James thought of it first and brought their mom and beat them to it. See, well, they all needed a lesson in what greatness really is because right now they're flying awful high on their pride and their ambition. So Jesus is going to give them a lesson. Let's read 24 through 27. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whosoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. In other words, if you want to be a success to God, then use your energy to make others successful. If you want to be great in God's eyes, then be unselfish and work to make the lives of other people much better. Whoever uses more of their energy to promote the welfare of others wins, as far as God is concerned. 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus is our creator, and he is our Lord. But he doesn't just boss us around giving us orders on a whim or because he's big enough and tough enough to do it. Jesus tells us to serve others. But he has done it himself, you see. Jesus never tells us to do something that he has not already done himself. As a matter of fact, if you look at all of the commands of God the moral law, you will see that they are all a reflection of God's holy character. So he's not asking us to be something that he's not. He's not asking us to do something that he hasn't already done. And it's the same with Jesus. He says it right here. You want to be great? Then be a servant. Just like me. I came to be a servant. Greatest servant who ever was. So Jesus tells us to serve others and to put others first. Why? Because that's what he did. He tells us to be good to those who do not treat us well. Why? Because that's what he did. He tells us to do good to those who cannot repay us. Because that's what he does all the time. Jesus is our God. But he is also our example. 29. Now, as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him. So a great multitude, a great crowd, followed Jesus back from Caesarea Philippi, which is where Jesus asked the question, Who do men say that I am? Caesarea Philippi was about 150 miles from Jerusalem. The nation as a whole officially, was rejecting Christ. So he set a course for Jerusalem and the cross. Holy Week is right around the corner. 
30. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. These two blind men had heard all about our Lord's miracles, and they had hoped, no doubt, and prayed that someday they would get a chance to see him and meet him in person. And now Jesus is within shouting distance. They're never going to get this close to Jesus again. This is their one opportunity, so they let loose, man. They're gonna, they are trying to get his attention, and they're not holding back. 31, then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet. But they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. These two blind men didn't care how undignified they might have looked or who wanted to quiet them down because they were excited about Jesus and they're going to keep shouting until they get his attention. He's either going to say yes or no, but they're going to, he's going to know that these two guys were there and they're not going to quit. That, so what? Sort of like uh, Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. Give me Jesus or give me death. I really don't care. It doesn't matter. That's the attitude that you have to have when you receive him as Lord and Savior. Give me Jesus or give me death. Nothing matters. I need him more than anything. Want him more than anything. That'll get his attention and that'll get him to save you when you're that sincere. Don't listen to these modern evangelicals who say that you can ask Jesus just flippantly praying a sinner's prayer and asking him to be your Savior without ever repenting. Don't listen. They're lying to you. They are Satan's instruments to send you straight to hell. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish, Jesus said. And they have the nerve to say, never, ever tell a lost sinner to repent. My goodness, are they out of their ever-loving mind? Must be. Their theology has driven them mad. And it's not Bible theology. Not when you make statements like that. And they do. Give me Jesus or give me death. Oh, Patrick Henry, man. You know, he was a, he was a strong Christian. He was an orator because his mom took him to church every Sunday when he was a little boy. And his mom made him, on the carriage ride home, recite the sermon. That's where he learned to be a great orator. He, he learned how to preach. Getting a little off track, but... Let's read 32. So Jesus stood, stood still and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? Well, you don't need to be Almighty God, like Jesus, to know that these two men wanted to see again. That's, I mean, they were blind. Why else would they be crying out to Jesus? Everybody knew that. Jesus knew what they wanted too. But he still wanted them to ask. God knows what you and I need. And God knows what you and I want. But he still wants us to ask him and to talk to him about it. That means prayer. Now, there are certain things that God will not do. Unless we ask for them in prayer. You have not because you ask not. There are other things that God won't do even if you do pray. And then there are other things that God does automatically whether we pray for them or not. The trick is God hasn't told us which ones are which. So we have to pray. And he wanted these guys to pray to ask him, 33, they said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. They said, we want to see. So they made the request specific to Jesus. When we have something to say to God, we should just say it. Don't beat around the bush. Don't worry about, there's nothing wrong with formal prayers. That's fine. But man, when you need something, just don't beat around the bush. Just ask Jesus plain and simple language. He understands. He understands plain English or plain Spanish or plain Russia. It doesn't matter. Russian. 34. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes. 
And immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. And one thing you can be sure of, and that is that Christ cares about whatever it is that's making you feel bad. And that's because he has compassion. Jesus is not a distant deity. He is our God. He is our creator. He is our savior. The Bible says he's our brother. And he feels for us. And he will always do what is best for us. Even if we're not sure. Even if we don't think it is. He will always do the best thing for us. Compassion does not mean that he will always give you everything that you want. And it doesn't mean that he will always make the bad go away because he has never promised to make you happy in this life. Happiness for a Christian is promised for eternity, not for this life. Tell that, tell, tell the word of faith people to put that in their pipe and smoke it. Whatever in the world that means. But it's true. Your best days now, Joel Osteen. What a fool. What a liar. What an opportunist. What a money-grabbing, slick snake he is with his big grin. Your best days now. God Almighty has never promised you your best days now. He's never, ever, ever promised you happiness in this life if you're a Christian. Never. Next life, not this life. They're lying to you. They want your money. This will be their best, their best days right now because they're going to die and go to hell if they don't repent. But just so you know, compassion from God doesn't mean that he's always going to give you everything that you want. doesn't always mean that he's going to make the bad that you hate go away. But he does know what he's doing and he knows what is best for you. And Jesus had compassion on these two men. And they could immediately see. And boy, they ended up receiving Christ as Lord and Savior. How about that? Because sometimes God does give us exactly what we ask for. Okay, we'll stop for today. Study all of God's Word with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. Remember, there are 37 years of archives going through the Bible. Four complete series going on five. All there for you, again, at thebibleversebyverse.com. If you want to be a part of this ministry, you can be by praying for me and God's Word. That makes you an immediate part of this ministry. And also, when you take a break from studying with me at thebibleversebyverse.com, you can go to the front page, click the Donate button, and prayerfully give us the Lord may lead. That also makes you a part of this ministry. I will see you next time right here on Scripture Verse by Verse. Until then, thanks for studying with me. So long, everyone.